ተቀበሪ ኢዝ ቤት ሩን ዋን ኦፍ ዚ ስኒከርስ ኢዝ አይ ቢሊቭ ሶ ቢኮዝ ሂ ኢዝ አ ኮሊግ ኦፍ ማይ አ ፍሬንድ ኦፍ ማይ ኢራ ባራቦታ ኢዝ ሜስተ ሳንቲሪኔ ኢስት ኒካቶሪ ሩስኪ ኡቻኒ ሳንት ኢሬኔ это нашу возможность как-то обмениваться тоже у нас участники могут писать в чат сообщения вот я имела в виду то что кто-то как-то Ich habe registriert, nada ime gelat cevota, stota, jest zjes registracione. What registration are you? No, that is on my computer. English. Olga at the moment, <laughs> not Natasha. Okay, so, so what, what registration were you speaking about? See here in the computer, it says registration, that is to record on, mm -hmm. on my computer, yeah. Okay, and one minute says, before the start. Then it says register the alt R. Alt. alt. No, you, you don't need that. You don't need that. You don't. I don't need that. It's not on there. Да, переводчик все прошел. Одна минута. Мы готовы. Я думаю, что у нас эфир на Фейсбуке стартует ровно в 17. Давайте убедимся в том, что он стартовал. Сейчас вот буквально дайте нам 30 секунд. И... Uh, we need about 30 seconds to uh, get on air on Facebook. So um, we're, we're just about to start. Yes, we are on air. Okay, we're on air. Prince, dear uh, brothers and sisters, we are continuing the third section of, a conf of our conference uh, of, of the contemporary uh, Orthodox ecclesiology uh, and the basis of the unity of the church. And uh, today's session is called uh, the unity and the subordinate, um, the conciliar nature of the uh, church. We have four members here for participants and uh, we can ask questions uh, as we have said before you can raise your hand either digitally uh, or you can write uh, a question in chat and for those uh, taking part uh, in the session you can also just speak uh, so uh, Uh, we're going to work up to seven o'clock in the evening, Moscow time. And I'm ready to um, introduce the first uh, speaker today, uh, Julia Stonder, who represents St. Peret's Orthodox Institute. Uh, her presentation uh, is the image of Christian unity in the theological thought of Dietrich von Hofer. Thank you, Zonia Alma. 
Dear fathers, dear brothers and sisters, dear participants and uh, listeners of our, of our conference, I'm greatly honored to be able to take part in this conference and to present uh, my paper dedicated to the image of Christian unity in the theological thought of Dietrich Bonhoeffer. On the 8th of April, 1945, Pastor Dietrich Bonhoeffer sent a message via an Englishman, Payne Best, his last message, last before his martyr's death, and in it he said, uh, this is for me the end, but also the beginning. I believe in the principle of our universal, universal Christian brotherhood, which rises above all national hatred and that our victory is certain. This message was addressed to the English Bishop George Bell. Um, at first, Payne Best, being an officer of secret services, decided that this was a somehow ciphered message of a political character, and probably Bishop Bell was supposed to know what it was, uh, uh, what it meant. Uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer asked him to repeat the message twice and to learn it by heart, which fitted the scheme. But after the war, uh, in his co co correspondence with Bishop Bell, disproved this idea because there was no previous agreement with uh, Bonhoeffer. And besides, this message was too short to contain some inner hidden meaning. There was no political idea behind these words. This last uh, will uh, of the German theological uh, was about the universal brotherhood and it uh, had a real basis in his experience in his life experience what brotherhood did he speak of uh, what is it and uh, what in this respect is the nature of the unity of the church in the understanding of Dietrich Bonhoeffer knowing the context of the life of the theologian, the theologian may shed some light on the meaning of this message for him, uh, this notion of Christian union, union is not idealistic. It is inseparably connected to the experience of Christian life in a community uh, on the one hand and on the contemplation of the basis of the community life and the church in general on the other hand. In 1932, uh, uh, Bonhoeffer spoke about brotherhood on a youth conference in Galland preaching uh, peace, the church proclaims new humankind, holy brotherhood in, her, in Christ. This brotherhood bases uh, on peace, which uh, Christ has brought into this world on his cross in the community of meek and humble standing beside the cross, sober, believing, obedient community of those who want to be merciful. And that is the new brotherhood. He contemplates the theme of this unity on, uh, of the church in many of his speeches, starting from his earliest paper, in particular in his thesis, Sanctorium Communion, dealing with the questions of the sociology of the church, he writes, uh, in the modern times, a lot is said about the unity of churches, but it is, uh, but we must not forget that the unity from below is not the same as the unity given from above. And the desire of unity, uh, first of all, must be realized in small and even very, very small communities. Uh, the way to unity meets uh, hard resistance in this world uh, because the will to unity is, uh, and the stronger is the will to unity, the stronger is the re resistance of individualism. Uh, this uh, unity of spirit uh, grows from the Christian community, which has its basis in the gospel. May all be one, just as you, Father, are in me and I am in you. Uh, the unity of the church is visually embodied in the Christian community. And Bonhoeffer defines that the church is Christ uh, existing as a community. The unity of the members of uh, the community grows not from uh, 
the similarity of their um, views, opinions, their convictions, but from the similarity of their faith. Uh, Von Herfes cites uh, Apostle Paul, one body, one spirit, one God, one faith, one baptism, one bog and, uh, God and Father above all. Uh, um, and uh, in his book, Life Together, he writes that uh, uh, this unity uh, is uh, is not dependent on uh, uh, emotional attachments, likes or dislikes of the uh, members of the community. Um, uh, and uh, but only on the um, action of God inside the Christian community. Uh, moreover, um, uh, the more uh, difference there is between the people, the more this unity is revealed in Christ. Another um, aspect of this unity that uh, Pastor Dietrich von Hofer speaks of is uh, the personal character uh, of this unity. Um, a human person uh, is not diminished by community life, uh, but on the contrary, it reaches its perfection. Um, a human person, um, uh, the unity is perfect, but it is filled with a tension which shows its eschatological nature. Uh, in his book, Discipleship, uh, Van Herfer says that beginning from the Pentecost, Christ exists in an image of his body, uh, the community. To be in Christ means to be in a community. If we're in a community, we're in Christ. Um, uh, so being in this community is the condition of uh, the unity of the church. Uh, this book, uh, uh, Life Together, uh, was written in 1939, and it is based on his experience of, of brotherhood. Uh, he writes, Christian brotherhood is not an idea which we would like to accomplish, but it is a God's revealed reality in Christ, which we are allowed to participate in. Um, he also contemplates the issue of the church unity in his works that were written in the period of his rectorship in the pastor seminary in the confess of the Confessing Church in 1935-37. One of the peculiarities of the seminary was uh, uh, that its goal was not only giving uh, the knowledge to um, future pastors, uh, but the life of the seminary was ba founded on community basis. The routine of the Brotherhood House uh, was rather strict. The brothers uh, had only the very um, necessary things they could own. Everything else was the property of the seminary. Um, uh, but they could only spend uh, a limited time in the Brotherhood uh, House. Uh, Van Herfer wrote that uh, not uh, um, a monastic type of life uh, uh, they were trying to build, but uh, an inner concentration on the ministry outward, and that was their goal. Um, um, Van Herfer realized that um, to perform their ministry, future pastors needed spiritual food. Um, uh, it was supposed that the students, uh, after graduating the seminary, uh, had to go to uh, very different, distant, and sometimes difficult places. And uh, if, they, if they had such desire, they could gather together in their free time, for example, uh, during the uh, vocations and spend several days together and then go apart to uh, fulfill their ministry. In one of his, his letters, he wrote, um, um, in such times, let no one think that he may stand alone. We all stand together uh, uh, in prayer that we must um, uh, invocate for each other. Uh, he also cites uh, the works of uh, Alexei Konikov, um, and he says that the blood of the church is the prayerful uh, petition for, for each other. 
um, and this is a very important uh, thing for him, this prayerful petition for each other. Um, and he writes about it in uh, different letters uh, to the brothers of the seminary. Uh, uh, but uh, from his letters from uh, prison, he doesn't mention the brotherhood for uh, the risk uh, of the being censured, but um, in the ends of his letters, he um, closes them with the words, um, asking for a prayer uh, solicitation, you're faithful in Christ, Dieter van Hofer. Another aspect uh, that I would like to point out is Christian denominations. Starting from 1933, Bonhoeffer was an active member of ecumenical movement, and he contemplated a lot the questions of Christian uh, confessions. Uh, he deals with this problem in his work, What is a Confession, 1937, and Protestantism Without Reformation, written in August 1939, after his trip to the USA. In these works, uh, Bonhoeffer connects the notion of denomination with the historical, political, and social relationships. Denomination is a free union of Christians on the ground of common Christian life, but also on the historical, political, and social experience. Uh, uh, there are also some drafts of a lecture um, uh, where he defines a confession as a testimony, um, um, uh, a witness, which is a, a, a directed to God. Um, isolation and absolutation of each of these elements le leads to division. Uh, the invisible church, the church as a mystical organism is on the other side of denominations. Uh, denominations are visible members of the invisible church. Therefore, Dietrich Bonhoeffer understands the unity of the church through the embodied love of Christ revealed in the community. The desire of the church unity is first of all incarnated in small communities and the genesis of the universal Christian brotherhood starts with the birth of small communities. Universal Christian Brotherhood is not an ideological or ideal model. It deals with specific commu communities that grow into a larger fellowship. To summarize, we can distinguish the following aspects of the image of church unity in the uh, theology of Dietrich von Hofer. The mystical aspect, uh, which deals with the gospel revelation and comprehensions of the church, which is Christ himself, who is, exists as a community that they will be all one just as you father are in me and you are, and i am in you john 17 21. the church belongs to christ and its unity is the unity of the faithful of those who were born in christ the next is a personal aspect the personality of every member of the community is not diminished or depreciated by uh, the community but on the contrary it is revealed in the unity with christ and the other faithful members of the community. The unity of the church is revealed in this prayer petitions for each other. Uh, aesthetic, a, a aesthetic aspect implies uh, the relationships between the members of the community, their mutual discipline, obedience, discerning emotional and spiritual realities, the desire to see a brother in every member of the community, disregarding personal likes or dislikes canonical aspect, which deals with the issue of Christian denominations. This question of the division of the church, Dietrich von Hofer doesn't regard as a theological one, but as one of historical, political, and social experience. We may observe uh, that uh, um, this last will of Dietrich von Hofer about universal brotherhood reveals its eschatological character. And on the other hand, it is addressed not only to the Anglican bishop, but also to us. It is directed to the future. Um, uh, as an especially important aspect of von Hofer's theological thought, we may point out an image of unity as a, uh, a Christian community, for out of those small units, communities, grows the image of the church and visibly reveals this unity to this world. Uh, uh, 
this is all. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you for fitting into the given time, please. We are waiting for your questions. Who would like to uh, to ask this question? Yulia, Yulia Balakshina wants to ask. Okay. Uh, good evening. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, our uh, contemplation comes to a new level. And uh, we are speaking that the center of this Christian unity should be um, uh, a particular Christian community of brotherhood. So the question uh, is, how did Van Hoeffer think uh, or had, how did he uh, envision the connection between uh, these units, the small communities and brotherhoods. Thank you for your question. Uh, I have to point out uh, the question of uh, ecumenical connections, relations, uh, but her firm regarded uh, inside the Protestant paradigm. And so his efforts were directed to the direction of uh, uh, unity of uh, different dimensions, denominations uh, within the Protestant church. But if we regard his particular experience of uh, creating different communities when in the period when uh, uh, there was the Hitler's regime in Germany. Uh, uh, the very fact of this confessing church that he uh, was uh, has formed, uh, uh, where uh, different pastors uh, took part in it, and they lived in this brotherhood house and uh, had their ministry there. And the life in this brotherhood uh, house was uh, for them, a point of inspiration that gave them strength to um, uh, carry out their ministry. And his practical efforts uh, to uniting different congregations and communities in Germany at that period, uh, in these difficult circumstances, uh, political circumstances. Uh, but also in his theological works, he deals with this question I have pointed out for myself that uh, he's a mystic. He speaks about Christianity in general, about the revelation of Christ uh, in the church. But he doesn't. Uh, he doesn't try to uh, uh, plan some uh, some steps, uh, practical steps of. Um, uh, gaining this unity of the uh, Protestant and Catholic Church or Orthodox and Catholic Church. That's not what he was thinking about. If I understand you correctly, on the mystical level, this unity of the community is um, based on uh, the faith of people and on, on a practical level, it is based on the community or communion of the elders who were members of this one community uh, of pastors. Yes, that's true. Thank you very much, Yulia. Thank you, uh, Yulia Volokshina. I would like also to ask, um, there were, uh, Uh, there were uh, similar thoughts in the works of Russian uh, theologian Sergei Fudel. Uh, uh, he was speaking about uh, a, commu a Christian community as um, a gathering of people who are standing uh, near the cross of Christ. And it is, it is interesting that both of them are um, martyrs, um, uh, the confessors of faith. Uh, people who suffered for their open confession on faith. faith. But uh, continuing the question of Yulia Balakshina, I would like to ask, uh, Dietrich von Herfer was trying to unite people and he had this pastor seminary uh, 
and was trying to strengthen the church through uh, getting together, gathering together the uh, people who serve. Uh, so this was the brotherhood uh, uh, of ministry. Uh, what did he say about this? What, uh, what role did he see of this brotherhood in the life of the church? Thank you for your question. First of all, uh, I would like to recall uh, that Bonhoeffer uh, thought that the elders, the pastors, in the times when uh, when the church is persecuted, the confessing church was persecuted, uh, those pastors, they needed to, to receive, to be strengthened. Uh, and this uh, brother brotherly uh, relations uh, uh, were to strengthen those people. And in the in the places where they uh, served, uh, they uh, they could hardly find a truly a true believers. And uh, getting together, having this fellowship, they could strengthen each other in their faith. They could talk to other people, to uh, priests, uh, and and these were very practical steps in, in this difficult time. Uh, uh, requiring the unity of uh, those people who were uh, carrying out a ministry in the church. Uh, theologically, this communion of the elders um, uh, was, was uh, Uh, contemplated in uh, in the sense of uh, the universal priesthood. Uh, he stressed that uh, every member of the community should uh, be responsible for the church gathering. For us today, uh, it is important that his thought is very much connected with the Russian thought uh, uh, especially with the thought of Alexei Komikov and um, such intersections and intuitions, uh, theological revelations uh, are very are really precious for us. We have some uh, some more time left for maybe one more question. Alexander Kopirovsky. Uh, thank you very much. I had a chance to read it uh, before it was presented, and uh, before, and I liked it very much. Uh, I would like to uh, to ask you uh, this search for the unity of the church in the case with Dietrich Bonhoeffer, is it only within the Protestant reality? Or is there um, a way out of it uh, to the universal church? Well, maybe my uh, impression is subjective. But I think that it is. Uh, uh, he, he, I think that he surpasses his Protestant reality. Um, uh, there is a person who wrote a, a huge book about Bonhoeffer in 1970, and it, the book starts with the words uh, that Bonhoeffer surpasses the borders of countries and confessions surpassed uh, those borders of countries and confessions. When I uh, get in touch with the works of Bonhoeffer, I am deeply impressed by the deepness of uh, his mystical revelation, which is uh, uh, a very um, uh, uh, very important also for the orthodox situation now. I remember Professor Vasiliadis uh, speaking uh, 
uh, on one of the conferences uh, uh, saying that it is impossible to uh, gather an ecumenical council as or synod if there will not if there are no um, small communities um, that that grow from below uh, the, this uh, living force uh, the the living organism of the church uh, small communities um, uh, that give the possibility of uh, uh, holistic uh, full um, uh, realization of this unity. So I think that Bonhoeffer's thought is as as never uh, important for the orthodox situation. Unfortunately, the limits, the time limits that I had in my presentation uh, did not allow me to uh, present a, a wider analysis uh, um, and, um, of his works, uh, especially his um, thesis. Um, but uh, this is uh, some, something that uh, we should really pay attention to and contemplate uh, uh, and, uh, and imply in our contemporary life. Thank you very much. I really hope that uh, this sounds like um, a promise of a translation. Uh, another question from chat. Uh, Inna Tukachenka asks, uh, this uh, thought of a universal brotherhood, is, it, is there any correspondence to the thoughts, uh, to the similar idea of Nikolai Nikluev of a universal brotherhood as well? I said in the beginning that this thought uh, that even for the person it was addressed to, it was not quite uh, quite uh, comprehensible. It was a mystical uh, revelation, uh, and it is it is uh, it is a coincidence, but maybe not. Um, uh, Maybe there is something behind it that in a different country uh, there was a similar intuition, uh, as well as uh, what Zoya Dashevska mentioned that Sergei Fudil also spoke about the community of the people standing be besides the cross of Christ. Uh, uh, but Hofer was uh, uh, thinking about the cross of Christ. He said that. Uh, we live, uh, as we live in the church, we must take the responsibility for the life of the church because Christ is being crucified every day. And his idea of the universal brotherhood uh, was confirmed by his experience um, of his life in a community and his martyr's death, uh, which has uh, um, it's a force in itself and a certain perspective and gives a certain perspective. Thank you very much for your presentation. And uh, there are also there is also gratitude expressed in the chat. So uh, we may go on, but um, Yulia Antipina, a researcher from St. Petersburg is presenting um, a presentation about the sacrament of Saborovania in uh, the works of uh, Father Sergius Bolgakov. Thank you very much for the opportunity to present my paper. I uh, propose to research the notion of the sacrament of Saborovania in the works of Father Sergius uh, Bolgakov. The Russian word Saborovania means the sacrament of the anointing of the sick or the holy unction, one of the seven sacraments. But um, the word Saborovania is related to the word Sabornost. And so Father Sergius proposes to speak of Saborovania as the sacrament of realization of the conciliar nature of the church. Uh, we will describe the inner structure and the content of the sacrament basing on the mystagogical works of Father Georgi Kochetkov, 
and more specifically on the proposed by him distinction of the ritual, sacramental and mysterial sides of the sacrament. Uh, the, um, uh, the, the topic of the Church of Christ is the central topic in the theological thought of uh, Father Sergius Bulgakov. He understood the Church in a twofold manner as an ontological and empirical phenomenon. On the one hand, the Church as the mystical matter, which we would spell uh, with a capital letter in Russian, is the divine humanity. Uh, is the interconnection of the divine and the created, uh, the inseparable and non-merging mutual penetration, the pre-eternal design of God about the world and the final point of creation. On the other hand, it, it is a human community accomplishing its historical journey. Um, uh, and um, However, in the process of this historical development, the church is called to reveal its mystical content. Humanity is called to become the divine humanity, which is the genuine foundation of that creation. Thus, we can see that although Father Sergius distinguishes uh, the mystical and the empirical church, he doesn't separate them. He calls these two dimens uh, them the two dimensions of the church. Uh, not all... Um, um, uh, the experience of the historical church can be regarded as its historical development. For example, its historical division can hardly be regarded as historical development because it distorts and destroys the nature of the church's uh, unity. In Father Sergio's opinion, the unity is not just an essential quality of the church, it is its nature. On the one hand, the church is the... Uh, 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 human divine unity as the body of Christ in which many members are gathered together under the dominion of Christ. On the other hand, the church uh, as divine humanity is understood as the temple of the Holy Spirit. Both images of the church as the body of Christ and as the temple of the Holy Spirit reveal the idea of gathering together, which is subornist, which implies that the church is a living union, union in diversity. Father Sergius deeply felt all the historical divisions of churches. Uh, uh, and for him, this, these divisions uh, were not a, a mere historical fact, but a mystical event, and not just a question of organization, but a spiritual discord and therefore a spiritual challenge. Um, the phenomenon of Sabonist in the history of the church, Father Serge is defined as a certain spiritual unity and mutual communion of all the Christian world, although it is not expressed in any formal agreements uh, as a mystical unity. Uh, the guarantee of this unity is the church tradition of which perhaps in different degree uh, and with unequal depth, all the Christian churches partake. On the other hand, this unity needs to be actualized, performed. And um, the act of performing of this Christian unity, Father Serge has regarded as a church sacrament. Um, uh, and he said that um, the church, the Catholic church is the church of Saborovania, uh, i.e. the church of gathering. Um, to get a clear idea of the sacrament of Saborovnia, we must say a few words about Father Serge's notion of sacrament in general. He thought that in the foundation of all the church sacraments and sacramentals, there is an all sacrament, which is the church itself, uh, as the divine humanity, a living God's incarnation, and the Pentecost of the Spirit uh, in their dwelling strength. This all sacrament, as having no borders in itself, accomplishes itself in this world, and in the humankind, above all the world and above all humankind. And all the usual church sacraments uh, have a, deriv a derivative relation with the old sacrament. Uh, that is uh, why Father Searches could consider a sacrament um, um, 
uh, as a sacrament in a usual narrow sense, any expressed action in the church and in man. Uh, he did not limit the number of sacraments to seven. We must not think that only to seven sacraments, no more, no less, is limited the, the strength of the church and its action in us. Um, uh, this allows us to engage to our contemplation the mystagogical works of Father Georgi Kocherkov, um, uh, which is one of the examples uh, of a full and consistent presentation of the Orthodox tradition of mystagogy based on a five decade practice of catechesis. In this mystagogical cycle, Father Georgi states uh, that any church sacrament can be seen uh, as a threefold unity. It has a mysterious sacramental and ritual aspects, and each of these aspects are closely related and connected with each other, but still they have their own content. Uh, uh, the right, the ritual has to do with the right, with the uh, outward form. Um, uh, the mysterial um, uh, ha the sacramental also has an inner structure um, and um, and the mysterial aspect uh, indicates the goal to which all the sacraments are directed which is the inner substance of the sacrament As far as the ritual or the shape of the sacrament of Saborovany is concerned, Father Sergius writes that um, uh, uh, Saborovany can take different shapes. And one of the most adequate uh, in the church history is a church council, Sabor. Church gatherings or councils and their exact meaning are the most natural and direct means of uh, the sacrament of Saborovany. Um, potentially, um, any church gathering strives to accomplish the nature of the church uh, of the Saboranist, but it doesn't always succeed. Uh, in the 20th century, the idea of universal priesthood was revived as applied to the Eucharistic ministry, thanks to the works of Father Nicholas Afanasiev and Father Alexander Schmemann. This idea can also be applied to the uh, accomplishment of the sacrament of Saborovnia. Uh, uh, and in this case, the practice when the councils consist only of bishops can be regarded as a certain distortion of the church norm, um, uh, such as uh, it, it can be called a, a manifestation of clericalism. In a normal case, the church gathering um, in the sacrament of Saborovnia should be represented not only by the uh, clergy, but also by lay people. And Father Sergius reminds us about the experience of the Council of 1917 in Russia, where he took part uh, also as uh, a lay person. Um, uh, since the church tradition is a living tradition, new forms uh, of uh, the sacrament of Saborovnia can appear. And for example, our gathering today can be uh, regarded as one of the forms of the sacrament of Saborovnia. Oh. Um, Father Georg in his mystagogical cycle distinguishes the sacraments of prayer, of faith, and of life. And uh, he speaks about the inner structure He's, he calls it the normal of uh, the sacraments of, uh, um, and in, in the case with the sacraments of faith or dogmatic sacraments, it is not always as explicit as in the case with the liturgical sacraments, but we should try to name and characterize these um, uh, stages of the sacrament. The first stage uh, is uh, the preparation. Every sacrament requires a certain preparation before it may be accomplished. Father Sergius speaks that the preparation says that the preparation to the sacrament of Saborovania consists in 
widening of religious consciousness. This personal religious consciousness is characteristic of every everyone, every Christian, but it may remain vague and indiscreet. But uh, while we prepare to the sacrament of Sabornia, um, it may widen and deepen. And, it, and thus it may become an over-personal, above-personal collective. Uh, the, the beginning of the sacrament uh, uh, is always, always implies a recollection, remembrance, which has two dimension, dimensions. Person Um, um, the comprehension of the church experience in church gathering is personal. It is the presence of the soul in the face of God. It is God and me in the living and ceasing relation. Personal theological discourse, which uh, appears in a man's mind as a result of spiritual awakening, um, uh, um, uh, awakening of mind. It must not remain individual, but must strive to become the theology of the tradition. Uh, it does not uh, mean that personal theological discourse must be only a repetition of something which has already been said and uh, is present in the tradition, but um, uh, it revives the tradition, um, uh, actualizes the church tradition in the life of man. And it requires uh, a personal inspiration and the according intensity of spiritual life. Next stage uh, in a sacrament is epiclesis. It usually implies, uh, implies the main petition, the calling upon God and uh, and upon the power of his grace in prayer and also the formula. Um, uh, Father Sergius um, says that uh, every uh, church gathering usually opens with a prayer and as, as, as a formula, as a the declarative formula, Father Sergius gives the words we know from the descriptions of the ecumenical councils. They were all in the full conscience of true uh, conciliarate um, and at the same time in searching for its uh, saying uh, of themselves, for it, has seemed to, uh, for it has seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us. And thus they put an equation mark between themselves and the church as a collective life and the Holy Spirit. Uh, Um, uh, Father Sergius also speaks about the gifts of the sacrament, and he sees those gifts in um, the fulfillment, the feeling, the widening of our hearts, the sense of daring before God uh, and the church, the new birth, the renewal, and the revival. And uh, the gifts also uh, bring forward the fruit, the spiritual fruit of the sacrament. Um, Uh, which um, which also implies this uh, uh, acquiring of Christian unity. Um, uh, not only um, uh, uni uh, the unity of um, uh, one particular community, but also the um, unity between the uh, denominations and confessions. Um, the borders of the historical church don't reach to the sky. Um, um, Father Sergio states that in the Constantinian period, um, Saborovania was accomplished as an effort of the hierarchy. But, but uh, now as we speak about the post-Constantinian period, Father Sergius uh, proposes to revive the church conciliarity of subordinates as an effort from below, not from above. 
as a spiritual ministry of all the members of the church, disregarding whether they represent the hierarchy or not. Um, and also, um, Uh, he connects uh, the revival of Sabornist uh, with um, uh, the ministry of uh, church uh, communities, and he sees um, um, he sees um, uh, the unity uh, of. Uh, those communities as a, uh, as a sort of a diocese. And we see a contradiction here because he um, uh, we can recall in 1928 the appearance of the brother of St. Sergius and Albanius where Father Sergius took part in. And there uh, we witnessed that um, there was this interconfessional communion between Anglicans and Orthodox, and uh, on the side of the Orthodox, uh, the Brotherhood was represented by the Russian student Christian um, movement and the St. Sergius Inst uh, Orthodox Institute, uh, not by the church institution, uh, the diocese um, uh, in, in Paris. So this experience of suborvania, of the sacrament, um, the, the hope of, of this, uh, the, arrival, the arrival of the sacrament uh, should be connected with the revival of such uh, communities and brotherhoods and not to the institutional church. Thank you very much. Thank you for your presentation and a special thanks to you for the presentation, for giving us this opportunity to see uh, the works of uh, the spiritual daughter of Father Sergius, uh, Sister Ioana Reitlinger, and uh, it is such a joy to see them every time we see them. Um, and also these photos open to us uh, something about the sacrament of Saboronia. Yeah? We, we see that uh, the bishops are not above the church, but within the church, together with the lay people, with the priests. It is also an image of Saborovania. For, for us, it is um, a mark of the time. Okay, who would like to ask a question? Oh, we have uh, such um, opportunity now. Uh, we invite you to take part in the discussion. Alexander Kopiorowski has a question. I wanted to say that just the same what the uh, has said has just said. Seeing that these last conference, uh, uh, these last uh, photos, a visual image of Saboronia. Yes, it is a gathering. Maybe they discussed something, but the sense of unity. Uh, is is very present in this uh, photo. There's inner freedom, there's beautiful faces, you know, many of which we know, not only bishops, there are saints, future saints um, and martyrs. So we can see uh, uh, Father Lugovsky, um, uh, Mother Maria Skopcova and, and uh, uh, the future theologian, Father Vasily Zinkovsky. It is very, um, uh, as I said, uh, that such images uh, witness uh, to the fact that uh, this really happens, this sacrament of Saborinia. Uh, this is my impression, um, a very good impression. I think that uh, we must get deeper into the lives of those people. They are not far from us. They have felt, they have sensed this uh, uh, sacrament, experienced it. And on the other hand, 
uh, subordinate as a liturgical term it has also to be revived because initially it is something uh, it is something that has to do with the gathering of the church and not of an individual healing uh, as as uh, uh, is the situation with the anointing of the sick Uh, can you comment on this? Uh, do, does he, uh, does, does Father Sergius um, comment this liturgical side of the sacrament? Or is it something quite separate? Well, I, I have contemplated this question of whether the sacrament of Saborovania in its liturgical meaning in, uh, in the Russian tradition uh, um, uh, uh, relates to this um, um, this design of uh, uh, the sacrament of Saborovania that Father Sergius speaks of. Um, well, I, I see that um, this um, sacrament of the anointing of the sick has uh, run into this risk uh, when uh, the the stress the emphasis is replaced from the the mystery which is happening to the person inside the church gathering or to the matter to the liturgical matter to the onion uh, uh, to, to the oil oh, which is being anointed But it is the same with other sacraments as well. Uh, for example, with the sacrament of the Eucharist, this is something that Father Alexander Schwemann writes about a lot uh, when he, and he's trying to uh, bring back the, the, uh, this, those emphasis, uh, this emphasis from the matter. Uh, Professor Vasiliadis, you may ask your question. Since we have uh, uh, friends from the Catholic Church, the closest example I can see comes from the uh, the Catholic Church, the bishop in Perga Bergamo in Italy last year, when he gave the commission to the doctors and even to the lay people, regardless of uh, their faith, to give the absolution before the funeral. I cannot say uh, anything more, but uh, I would invite uh, our Catholic brothers to, to see how we can see this kind of extending uh, the, the meaning of, uh, of our sacraments in special occasions, and why not in special cases? That's all from me. Could you please repeat a little bit the question? I, I didn't quite get it. What is the question? Uh, the question actually is uh, that in special occasions, like uh, the pandemic we had, uh, we have a, a similar example in the Catholic Church where in the mostly heat area in, near Milano, Bergamo, uh, I heard their bishop, their Catholic bishop, giving permission to lay people to conduct actually the absolution to the dead uh, people uh, who wouldn't be accompanied by a priest or for giving absolution or whatever. This is a, 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 a parallel example, not exactly uh, what we are discussing, but this is how I can see it. It's not a question, it's a remark or an invitation for our Catholics to see how they can uh, view our sacrament, because we have similar sacraments, our sacraments to be conducted in special occasions. The only case we have is 
the so-called uh, uh, air baptism conducted by a layman or for a small uh, kid who is dying without being able to be baptized. Se vuoi puoi tradurre, nel senso che è proprio una situazione. Я тогда, может быть, задам вопрос в конце, который у меня возник во время... Someone of the theologians of the circle of Father Sergius, uh, did they support Father Sergius? Uh, did he have, an, have any answer to his idea of Saboronia uh, uh, as uh, the sacrament of the unity of uh, the church? Uh, thank you for your question. I have uh, never come across any texts. Um, uh, speaking about this, but uh, I may not know them. Um, but we may turn to uh, the uh, works of uh, Father Sergius and what he also did, um, uh, and also the Brotherhood of Saint Sergius and Saint Arvanius. And uh, together with Father Sergius, um, uh, there, there was a whole number of people who took part in, in, in it. Uh, the professors of St. Sergius uh, uh, Institute and uh, priests, and this practice shows that his, his idea, his, his approach was supported. Well, maybe you will be able to find uh, uh, something uh, which uh, um, um, develops this thought of Father Searches and also connects it with the liturgical sacraments. This is something that can be very fruitful in, as a liturgical research. Uh, Maybe someone of uh, our Catholic friends taking part in in this uh, in our discussion wants to speak, and maybe to say something to um, on the remark of uh, Father Petrus Vasilidis. Well, it seems like no. Uh, let's. Uh, let's thank Yulia and Yukina and move on. We have uh, the next presentation by Sofia Androsenka representing St. Lourdes as well. And her topic is, uh, is the Ecclesiology of Nicholas Berdyaev and Dear fathers, brothers and sisters, um, I thank you for this opportunity to speak today in this gathering where I think the Dime himself would have been happy to speak. Um, we know that he actually ended up speaking in pubs and, and uh, student gatherings and even after the uh, the war, particularly.
particularly, he was particularly aggrieved at the level of discussions, even in the university environment. Um, but um, I think we may say that in terms of uh, Berdyaev's thought, it's not just um, a certain philosophical and theological level that is required, but there's also a certain um, certain way of life. Um, obviously, he lived in the church in the deepest sense of the word. Um, and it's hard to understand his thought outside that communion of saints. Uh, I think the main sort of power of in his uh, in his uh, thought and without him, all that personhood and freedom and soberness and all of the things that are associated with his with him are um, um, understood in a very fragmented way. And but to give, uh, but the ecclesiological theme, uh, frankly speaking, has mostly been explored by the Catholics. Well, there was a very interesting discussion in the 20th century. Unfortunately, I, I couldn't, I can't really dwell upon that. I put it in the, as a, uh, in the remarks, and maybe people will be able to read about this. I am um, in the Protestant environment uh, in the 1920s and 30s. He was seen really as a mediator. For instance. Uh, there was a certain Hans Ehrenberg who said, a professor who wrote to him, he said, you delve into the depths of the church without destroying its new mythological uh, character. He says, uh, he says, uh, he also expresses uh, a hope for further discussion and then says, I, but I support very much um, the direction of your anthropological discourse, at the same time accusing him uh, among the Catholic researchers. Um, we need to uh, stress, uh, we need to uh, Father Berhard Ber Ber Schulze from the Pontifical Institute in Rome. In 1930, he defended a thesis in the lifetime of Berdyaev, and he said it was called uh, the views of Berdyaev on the church. And he always thinks in terms of subordinates. Whenever he speaks, whether he speaks as a sociologian or historian, um, whether he's speaking on aesthetics, Again, I have to be quick about this interconfessional dialogue, but there was a lot of sympathy towards Berdyaev in the Catholic uh, world, including uh, Schulze, who, even though he says he's a Neoplatonic and, and maybe he misses some of the key points and some of the key categories, at, at least as far as I can tell. In terms of freedom, of, in terms of objectivism about the tragedy and creativity of uh, uh, the knowledge of God, of cognition, and he, uh, some of these things um, that are the key notions for Berdyaev are missed, I think. But the discussion with the Protest Protestants, uh, obviously, is in, in the Soviet Union, obviously, were prohibited as um, seen to be because they were seen to be dangerous but uh, the catholic discussion continues to see the way the uniqueness of the way that the dive saw tradition and and the nature of the church which was both attractive and scary to western theologians you need to understand the basics of his approach which sometimes you know caused them to call him a heretic uh, jokingly but he is actually fighting something that he called a heresy of life. 
uh, he called this a monophysite view of the church, a very specific stereotype view of the human um, nature as being the reason for all the deficiencies and problems and divisions in the divine human body of the church. So he's uh, fighting this mistrust towards man, this monophysite approach, as he calls it. He says that it, it, uh, uh, it, it is the greatest hindrance to um, for people to open up in communion, in the communion of life, in a positive content of Christian and church life. And the keys are come from Birdiaev himself. He says his thoughts are oriented ethically and eschatologically. And these are the two lines um, uh, that he says uh, define his understanding of subordinates and the tradition of the church. But to understand it better, you need to understand that the character of his ethics and his stories uh, and uh, understanding of history, if he says it's not normative, it's profitable. In other words, in terms of ethics, it means that there is no set or ideal or once and, and for all un, uh, approved by God a world of values, which is outside of man and sort of supersedes uh, the human uh, the human person. In terms of eschatology, there's no objective set goal of history. There's no aim towards which it is moving. There's sort of, there's no general divine plan that is only developing in history. Ethics, or at least, or more specifically, the world of relations and values, as it is understood by the God, in history is only um, sort of extracted from the divine providence. Not just that, it is also created by man in the process of knowing God. And when we talk about subordinates, we cannot do without the main anthropological discovery of the Jaif, which he expressed with the have with uh, the well-known myth about uncreated freedom on ground. Now, what is that myth? But Jaif briefly says that if you treat the revelation of man seriously as an image and a likeness of God, therefore uh, there's a kinship between man and God, and that kinship. Uh, manifests itself in the experience of freedom. And when he says that that freedom is not created, he wants to stress that it is not secondary, not something that God has power of, over, that he can give or take away or measure. It, it is um, unconditional, and in that sense, it's kind of equal to God. And in that sense, it is not transparent to God himself human freedom. Um, and here, um, you need to understand that Ungrund is not a something, it's not a substance, it's a potential. In other words, the scholastic teaching of the freedom of will or the freedom of choice, the Dai proposes his own understanding, understanding freedom as a power, as a source of absolute novelty. Uh, it cannot be reduced to a set of options, right or wrong choices, where which you have to where you have to pick something. As he talks about freedom as uh, something that defines the person from within. This is my creative power. This is not a choice between good and evil that is presented to me. This is a, my potential to create good and evil. And the freeing happens when the choice is already made and where I start on that creative journey. And God, with the eye for certain, expects that freedom from man. He doesn't want to curb it, doesn't want to make it harmless. On the contrary, he wants it to develop. He wants it to be discovered and to give uh, the power that it has. And that um, he mystical intuition in a way um, to a certain degree 
relates to what uh, Gregory Thalamus said about the uncreated divine energies. And he says that, uh, that these energies can come not just from God, but from a human being who was created in the image of God. Now, what is the, uh, the, the nature of that emanation? It's both cognitive, it has to do with logos and community. Uh, Alexander Schmemann, as a supporter of Eucharistic revival, would have probably been more interested in the essential qualities of man, and therefore he was the, the person who worships or the person who ministers, homo adorans. Birdiaev, as a philosopher and Gnostic, would probably say that man is first and foremost um, a cognitive being, a being that finds and discovers and produces meaning, and therefore uh, it's, a, it's a being of communication and communion. That sort of anthropology allows Bidyaev to state that cognition is not just a registration of facts, it's not just understanding the objective reality from which you have to be um, um, estranged to a degree to study it. And therefore, he says you can't, the process of cognition, the process of understanding, you cannot remove uh, the person from that. And subordinates, in a way, is the culmination, the climax of that. It's it's the main discovery of the uh, human spirit, he says, through which the process of theosis for the world happens. Uh, and the main body, the part, as it were, the main uh, instrument for that uh, for that knowledge and communion in Bidya's concept is conscience, understood not as an individual, as an individual ethical function, but as a holistic uh, human spirit. And this is, uh, it has to do with the potential, with the ability of uh, a person to, and to understand and accept the other person. Your content has to be living. It has to create its values in communion with other persons. Um, and it can be more or less superficial. And there's a whole teaching that Bhagav has on conscience and human conscience. And he says there's a certain deepening of conscience uh, in a, on a personal level and a discovery of its both individual and collective nature. And that is a way towards subordinates. And there are certain basic discoveries uh, that he says, this is the three principles of ethics. And he says, uh, even though they coexist uh, both in history and in the life of a person, yet there is a certain di um, direction, there's a certain dimension that they set. Now, the three ethics are this, the three invent inventions of the human spirit. The first is the ethics of the law, something we know from the Old Testament, from the biblical commandments, from the secular ethics. You could talk in the language of freedom. You, uh, you could express it with the formula, my freedom ends where the freedom of the other person begins. And it's, um, And uh, Berdyaev says that there's very little subordinate in it, that there's very little collective element to it because it atomizes people. It, it also is a, a manifestation of the godlessness of the world. God doesn't give the law, he says. He participates in it, in its um, accomplishment in Christ and in certain prophetic intuitions, there's a more New Testament related uh, and a more uh, graceful part of ethics, which is uh, uh, the ethics of uh, redemption, which means the formula here is that my freedom demands um, the freeing of the world from evil. 
And then finally, there's the supreme ethics, uh, the ethics of the church. And, and he believes that that is the ethics of creativity. This is the one that is really embodied in the church. And the dive says it's not just um, uh, an environment of friendship and redemption, but this is also an environment of people who uh, create a certain fellowship of those who want to know and to fulfill the purpose of their life. And it becomes, um, it emanates and it becomes creative. But the tragedy of all of these ethics can become in conflict within the person. And there are uh, certain uh, collisions that um, come as a result of that, where you have to choose between the, the good and the better as it were, and it is the person who has to make the choice. And it is in the ethics of creativity where the positive meaning of freedom uh, that is revealed, it has to be ecclesial, it has to be New Testament. And therefore, it says to believe in the freedom is to believe in the church. Um, to be free means to be in the church. Uh, so a certain question that you can't help asking is that how, how does a person uh, uh, avoid relativism in these um, paths of uh, freedom and creativity? Is there a criterion of truth within, is it within the person? Now, Bedev doesn't ask, underestimate the risks that freedom brings, yet he says that there is a positive meaning in history which is not um, revealed often and in in even in the incarnation he's it's not just kenesis that he sees not just his uh but it is from on the part of god but also the growing um of the human being um into divinity uh, in the fallen world, we we uh, are used to sort of looking for objective criteria, but he says in the spiritual world, you don't find them. It's your heart and it's your conscience that remains the only real criteria, criterion. He says it, the truth is not an object, an objective a reality, but a creative, uh, a, re a result of creative struggle. It's a creative, a transformation of reality. And it is, um, and there is a spiritual choice involved there, but it is not individual. This is done uh, and performed in relation with other uh, people, with God and the church. Thus, subordinates, uh, which the Gaif also, it, it's not like a, a common average. It's rather a selection. It's a, there's a potential that you can discover, that we can discover in each other. So it's nothing to do with equality. It's rather extreme inequality. And it's the spirit that overcomes the fallenness by um, revealing that shining nature of man um, that is directed at the transformation, the transfiguration of the world and the whole reality um, around um, around people so it's it's a certain power that comes from within that comes from uh, a certain unity between the divine and the human that comes from christ uh, the experience of tradition is very much akin to that of subordinate and it's also through gnosis through uh, cognition that he 
uh, talks about it. Uh, a life in the tradition is a life in eternity. It's understanding. It's not. Art, it's not about artifacts. It's not about manuscripts. It's about communion. It's about fellowship. And it is through the notion of tradition he describes um, the um, resurrection also as a, the. Uh, he says the mystery of the cross and the mystery of the tragic fate of love in this world um, that feeds up uh, this tradition. He also says uh, that tr the tradition is a creative and collective life of the spirit um, that uh, is based not on liturgical rites or doctrines or canons, but on the experience of communion and fellowship. It lives, tradition lives within people. It is created by them. It has the power to overcome all divisions and separations. And therefore, there's no objective God that you need to describe in correct theological categories, because even the physical world uh, is being changed uh, by human gnosis, by human knowledge. And in the same way, people who in communion learn to know each other. So tradition is not something you can give to or assign to a particular institution. They have no power over it in that sense. And in that sense, it is beyond the, the power of the church. You cannot, uh, he says there's no, there's no sense in looking for the ultimate authority in the church. He says this is a sinful uh, striving by definition. There's no ideal image of the church, uh, something. In and in terms of unity, you can't really achieve sort of the ultimate goal, but um, his great, his chief intuition about the church is this understanding of the uncreated elements, not just in, in the divine, but also in the human, to so saying the human in God and the divine in man. Uh, he said, he speaks of man as sort of partly uncreated in the part that he is close to God, that he is in the image of God. Um, and uh, therefore, the boldness, the freedom, uh, and in, in all of these things, um, there's a likeness into God. And yeah, communion is something that you cannot achieve alone, even if you're God. Thank you, Sophia. Thank you very much. Uh, while the rest are perhaps contemplating um, what questions they can ask, um, um, I can begin. You said that to be honest, uh, in Berdao's understanding, exists uh, alongside freedom, gnosis, and some other personal aspects, including freedom, of course. And so Bornas, you said, is a, is a sort of great, Vedya, uh, uh, of course, is a, a certain order of things. But uh, he says that there's a certain, it's like addition, it's complementarity to being. But Sabornas, what does it give to that sort of being, you know, the concept, the theological concept is very hard to uh, to understand the way it relates to um, the actual reality of life in the church. Uh, in terms of church unity, what does it change, Sabornas? What does it give us? What is the profit? Where does it lead us? Thank you very much for the question. Um, it helps us to understand unity as something that's not 
under the law, not an external factor, but it, it has to do with communion and mutual enrichment in terms of intuitions as well, and even the divisions that exist. And, and there's a certain thought in the dive that, that there is a certain mystery of, um, of God's plan that the Eastern and the Western church can learn from each other and they can enrich each other. So the differences in that case are not a hindrance. And I didn't say this, but you see, the very church and the very birth of Christ that Yahweh sees, and he insists on that, as an achievement, as an enrichment. It's not just a salvation operation, a rescue operation for the, for, for humanity. This is a mutual enrichment, and he, he speaks about this as God as was enriched by that and the uh, revelation of Christ's personhood and his sacrifice also is something that enriches God himself. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, any other questions? Um, there are some messages in the chat and thanking Sophia for uh, her presentation and also saying how amazing the guy's faith is in um, in the human being and in his creative ability uh, to be a co-creator with God. Uh, no more questions? Nobody else? Okay, if not, uh, we will say thank you to Sophia uh, for her contemplation of the Jai's texts, which are hard to, to put in a discourse analysis. Uh, there's a, a very strong prophetic element in them. And we now pass on to our last presentation today. Father Edward Farugia, representing the Pontific Eastern Institute of Eastern, Eastern, Eastern Studies. And, and to begin with, I'd like to ask Professor Farugia to correct his camera a little bit. We can't see you, Father Edward. If you could uh, move the camera a little bit so we can see you, because we can't see your face. Uh, um. Well, I'm the invisible man, you know. Uh, no. <laughs> ну, вот только что были видимы для всех, а сейчас вдруг стали невидимы. Если можно, если можно просто... Just recently you were visible, you have just... Maybe like the... Oh, yes. Вот, вот, да. Вот, вот да, прекрасно. Так просто замечательно. I thought... Uh, uh, тогда, может быть... Я озвучу uh, тему доклада. Let me introduce your presentation. So this is the uh, acceptance of the subornus term uh, in the later, in the latter days. The father Edward Farugia. So please, the floor is yours. Okay. Then uh, my title is Russian Orthodox term at heart of Catholic ecclesiology. Sobornos, coined expressly by Huyako in anti-Rome intent, became central to Lumen Gentium, that the doctrine becomes irreformable only when received by all the faithful, corresponds to the fourth Gallican article to combat which Vatican I was convoked. To understand how this could happen, we follow Catholic reception of the concept. So my first point is from Rasbornos to Sabornos. For Humyakov in Congar's Chrétien Désigny, 1937, uh, the church needs no external magisteria, the real one being a community of common faith and mutual love. 
Before the creed, all chant, let us love one another, so as to be able to confess in a unanimous consensus the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. By arbitrarily introducing the term into the creed, the Catholic Church destroyed this bond, and this is for whom Yaakov a fratricide. Nor is, it an, nor is an ecumenical council necessary. More than a dogmatic authority, an ecumenical council is a witness to the faith. Congar criticizes whom Yaakov for scant attention to the terrestrial church, attributing traits of the celestial church by defining it exclusively, exclusively through the spirit. In 19th century Russia, Westerners took the West as their model. Slavophiles, like Humyakov, wanted Russia to be itself. Were there no third alternatives, one might ask, to promote as a Christian both tradition and progress? Writing on the fifth centenary of Florence, 1438, so he was writing in 1948, Bernard Schulze, my predecessor actually, reacted to um, Humyakov seeking support in the four patriarchs' reply to Pius IX's invitation to return to the fold, 1848, agreeing with Arseniev that Humyakov was maybe the greatest Russian theologian and church father of the modern Russian church, as Samarin called him. Schulze criticizes the lack of a balanced soteriology in, Konga, in Humyakov. Christ's redemptive act being considered only from the viewpoint of eternity. The spiritual and the concrete historical aspects of the church gape wide apart. The relation between the internal, the mystical dimension of the church and its in external aspects so central to Homyakov, remain unmediated. Schulze adds, for Homyakov, what the Pope is for Catholics, the entire people are for Russia. So Homyakov sees no difference between teaching and learning church. Integral knowledge is possible only when conjoined to love. In this light, Protestantism logically follows from Rome's schism and rationalism. Quoting from memory, uh, Humyakov took Iperastisis, Greek defender, for Russian Hranitor, keeper, custodian. Inadvertently, uh, Humyakov misread the text of the four patriarchs, whose concern was certainly not to lessen their own authority but to curb the ambitions of hierarchs who introduced novelties, Greek synonym for heresy, kenotomia. Humyakov drew the conclusion that there is no special magisterium of the hierarchs. Saint Fularet of Moscow accepted as a born, but one with the hierarchs. O'Leary, a comprehensive approach. O'Leary attempts an all-round presentation of Homyakov. Uh, neglected areas receive detailed attention, disclosing their in-depth philosophical background. O'Leary, uh, an Irish Dominican, describes Homyakov as the first independent Russian theologian who was neither simply a self-taught theologian nor instinctively anti-Catholic. Humyakov and Filaret are cited as those with whom the real overcoming of westernizing in Russia theology starts. Unlike Filaret, so O'Leary, Humyakov did not base his thinking on the father, for he was more of a philosopher than a theologian. So he lacked a main sap of orthodox creativity, one may add, his being a thinker rather than a parrot stood him in good stead by introducing new categories into a stagnant Russian thought. If his mentality was conditioned by the political issue as to whether Russia belonged to Asia or to Europe, this slant 
helps explain why he correctly intuited what is generally Russian Orthodox. O'Leary cites Sergei Bulgakov, who says, the soul of orthodoxy is subornate, according to the perfect definition of Homyakov. Yet O'Leary forgets an important point. As Homyakov had written the first Sanskrit Russian dictionary, he would have studied the resemblances between paleogam and suborna. Another lost opportunity for O'Leary, but even for Schulze, is the following. Humyakov did not base his opposition to the addition on the Council of Ephesus, but on Chalcedon, when we have the first documentation of the Nicene Constantinopolis in Crete. A comparison of Birkbeck's edition of the Church's one, a Cirque of Adna, with Anna, uh, Antonella Cavazza's critical edition of the same, shows that the first refers to the prohibition of the Council of Ephesus in opposition to the decree of the whole church pronounced at the Council of Ephesus, to quote Humyakov. Kavatsa speaks instead of the prohibition at Chalcedon, which is more correct, really. Both Zernov and Berdyaev criticize Humyakov for his double standard in judging Eastern and Western Christianity. By concentrating on the inner life of orthodoxy, he oversees the East from Crete limits, whereas in focusing on the external life of the West, he is blind to their inner life. More important criticism is that Humyakov lacks any soteriology. Sutner had said that before, or eschatology, Berdyaev starts, so that there is no relationship between Christ's death and his church. If, as often asserted, the church had no visible head, this would weaken Eucharistic ecclesiology. Shmeiman Afanasiev, who based on the bishop, a very visible head. But the strangest mission is that Humyakov, whose subordinate has been translated as conciliarity, nowhere discusses the synodal form of church government. O'Leary winds up his presentation by a positive and objective evaluation of subordinates, which for him, as for Bulgakov, is the soul of orthodoxy. The strangest mission is that Humyakov, whose subordinates has been translated as conciliarity, nowhere discusses the synodal form of government. Now I turn to Hyacinth Destivel, who writes really a contemporary synthesis. He's a Dominican. Synodality is at the center of Destival's studies in the concrete of the Synod of Moscow. Congar himself preferred a modified form of Humyakov to Sergei Bulgakov himself. If Gracieux had mediated Humyakov to Congar, after Vatican II, Congar turned to Bolotov away from sheer complementarity to a hermeneutic of diversity. This implies a shift from apostolicity to Catholicity. For Congar, Humyakov, Solovyov, and Bolotov were three steps in the right direction. While the Orthodox Church itself never accepted the Slavophile form of Sabornos because of its sidetracking the magisterium, patristic Sabornos meant for the Orthodox the ecclesiology of communion with bishops within the, within the church, not outside of it. To create communion, one needs to purify memory. Benedict XVI deemed this more important than theological dialogue. Reconciliation calls for more than purifying memory, but also uh, one has to depollute nature and culture. Several Slavic countries celebrate the feast of St. Cyril and Methodius as a day of Slavic culture. Decentralizing Eurocentrism makes Christianity less European, but it has also made Europe less Christian. To prevent this, one should help Europe recover its Christian roots. Spiritual ecumenism in this sense must imply 
helping maiutically a paradigm shift to take place in such old institutions born in Asia and Africa and protracted in Europe as monasticism. Since the Orthodox Church has rejected the magisterium less subornos and homiakos, an unsuspected but unused approach to Vatican I thus comes to light. With the Moscow Sabor Synod of 1917 in mind, Destivel mentions three aspects of subornos, the democratic, including all the faithful without any distinction between the teaching and the learning church, the episcopalist, episcopalist view, emphasizing the authority of bishops, and the charismatic, which tries to combine both, allowing lay people the right to speak out and bishops a right to veto proposals or even decisions. Let's not forget that concurrently with the sin, uh, Rudolf Sam, who died exactly in 1917, accused the early church of having compromised Christianity through law. And Michel Sermonov in 1902 criticized canonists as indulging in a common law divorce from life. Now, please, what follows is my reflection. Uh, Another Catholic reflection on subornos. Kumiakov's typology in light of his correspondence with Palmer, which I found very interesting. Kumiakov, the Catholic Church is one but not free. Protestantism is free but not one. Orthodoxy is both one and free in the bond of love, brought him much criticism from Solovyov to Afanasia. How could such a fine philosopher the philosopher stood so low, especially as in his correspondence with William Palmer, uh, the younger, who died in 1879, fellow of Magdalene College, Oxford, he can be more nuanced. Kumyakov had another caricature in mind, the three-branch theory propounded by another Anglican who also had the name of William Palmer, but was older than the younger one who went to Russia and died in 1885, fellow of Worcester College and daughter of the treatise on the Church of, of Christ, published in 1838. The younger Palmer's two visits to Russia in 1840, 1841, 1842, came close on the heels of the publication of the elder Palmer's two volumes. More, Palmer had come to Russia to test the three branch theory, according to which the church is made of three branches, with orthodoxy for the Greek and Slavic people, Catholicism for the Latin people, and Protestantism for the English speaking people. As Humyakov's eighth letter to the younger farmer puts it, Romanism is nothing but separatist. Humanity has only one choice, Catholic orthodoxy or infidelity. All middle terms are nothing but preparatory steps towards the latter. Could all middle terms possibly, possibly exclude Anglicanism, especially as Anglicanism understood itself as the middle way between Roman Catholicism and continental Lutheranism? Long before Bolotov, who died in 1000, Humyakov had, on the other hand, sized up the filioque as not being a heresy, it's very explicit, but as an addition, it's fratricide. And this means he judged the filioque from a subordinate viewpoint, an opposition compromising East West interchanges. Now, a final recollection Humyakov's three pronged formula is, if it pretends to be literal, poor because it cannot do justice to any of the three Christian denominations he mentioned, even if it were to describe the concrete life of orthodoxy. The Synod of Crete, unfortunately, did not rely, relay for a smooth, soothing image of an agraphic union in, in union and faith, unity in union and faith, freedom. But if we take this three-pronged formula as an open question to our conscience, irrespective of which denomination we belong to, 
It is a stroke of genius. All three points can be addressed to all three denominations. There is moreover more than a pinch of truth in claiming that orthodoxy cherishes dearly the ideal of freedom and unity held together by love as it constantly prays to be under this way of the spirit. Instead of throwing stones at other denominations, I prefer to take up Homiakov's challenge and make an ecumenical examination of conscience. Subornos is usually rendered as collegiality, Catholicity, or synodality. So understood, it relays the benefit of gathering without constraint. We are together because we want to. As a Catholic, I see how little spontaneous our Catholicity can be without a touch of subornos to it. Take a typical reaction in the West to law. We may have the temptation to despise law, but we talk of the best things we have in terms of law, the canon of scripture, the canon of the mass, and the canon of saintliness, canonization. So why not call subornos canonicity? It is this canonicity which makes canon law canonical, a precept of love rather than an imposition of constraint. Therefore, the canon of truth and love, as well as the canon of law, recalls the perennial striving for a charismatic church, but without cowards. Remember some and the Russians at the time. Many a Westerner of whichever denomination has a somewhat deformed approach to liberty. What seems to stand in their way is the law, an attitude which can easily capsize into antinomianism. The argument this belongs or this does not belong to our tradition is much rarer than in Eastern Christianity, uh, maybe in the West, maybe because we tend to see tradition as constriction. Unfortunately, those who so argue do not realize how large canonicity is written in our blood. If one counts how often Yahweh in the Old Testament enjoins the, Israel, the Israelites to observe his commandment, and Christ sees in it the supreme love in observing his commandment, then one would think differently about law. Sabornos is really untranslatable with, by one word. So it could profit from being translated as canonicity as well, being in tune with the church by a connatural feeling. If we did, we would establish a link to what Homiakov says, the inner and the outer dimensions, which he so emphasizes, held together by the spirit. Conclusion, it is half a miracle that a concept like subornos with anti-Catholic implication came to be received after being purified in the heart of contemporary Catholic ecclesiology known as collegiality. The other half of the miracle would have been if Humyakov were an observer at the Vatican. With gratitude and an accrued sense of self-criticism, he would have rejoiced. Spasiba Bolshoi. Or as they said at the Council Dixit et anima miam salvat. I, I have relieved my soul and there. Okay. Thank you very much, Father Edward, for this uh, spacious uh, presentation and the demonstration of reception of the Homekov's thought. Uh, let me ask you a question. You mentioned Sobornost. You said, you said, yeah, this soothing image of agapic union. That's what you mentioned in, in your in your presentation. It's very close to us to what we think now in the 20th century in Russian church, these, you know, communities and brotherhoods just, you know, they came uh, uh, to being uh, in the beginning of 20th century and now they go on in different forms. So do you think this image of soothing image of an agapic union, is it 
perceived in Catholic Church not as a conciliarity or a sort of assembly that you have just mentioned, rather according to law or something like that. Well, do you have any, you know, correlation of the understanding of this as this agapic agapic union? Has it been implemented in the experience of such kinds of unions after the Vatican II? Well, uh, thank you for your question, which is very important and not easy to answer. I can give you an example. I knew a lady, she was a Protestant before, not an Orthodox, who became a Catholic in Germany. And uh, she read the Dutch Catechism. And she told me how beautiful, how beautiful. Then when she came to the last 80 pages, which in, were written to qualify that in Rome, oh, she told me I lost all my enthusiasm. Now, my friends, I too suffer under the law. I'm speaking like St. Paul. In a way, I prefer to be in heaven instead of being with you tonight, although being with you is a step towards that. You know, I think, however, it's precisely this con seeming contradiction. Law is always negative, whereas we want, as Rudolf Sohn said, a spontaneous Christianity. Christianity is love. I, I would say both of them are taken alone are nonsense. You know, take pedagogy. You know, if if one doesn't hear, if one has children, you know, one knows what it means that one follows the child all throughout. I can give you an example from once I was invited to an Eastern church. And uh, the people, I went to the divine liturgy, and there was a, a young, young, very young child. And he was sent to light a candle uh, at the, at the, during the divine liturgy. And I could see the whole community following him, you know, lest something happen. And then when he succeeded to light the candle, you could hear a sigh of relief uh, by the whole community that nothing happened to the child. Now that's an exact thing of what often happens in our, maybe not only we Westerners, maybe some Russians too, in our relationship to the law. We, just as we don't particularly like to pay taxes, we don't particularly like to hear of deadlocks and of, you know, take this and this vaccination and so many things. You know, there are people who even negate all these things. But deep down, are they helping the cause? Are they helping to heal society? And therefore, I think what Homiakov, and there he is really brilliant. That's why I don't like reducing him so only to collegiality, Catholicity, uh, synodality. I mean, why not say, I'm using an offensive word, but to, to bring, to show how he brought the union together, at least in his thought. Why not say, yes, as Kant says, Heaven means when I do law because I like it. When I do it because it's a pleasure for me. For me, for example, to study is a pleasure. To be with people is a pleasure. And therefore, you know, I don't have to make a decision to do it. And this is a very important point, I think, and very often missed because what people get out of Homiakov very often is that he's, you know, very one-sided and how could he believe this? But Tserkov Adna was only the first theological thing. Read his letters to, pa uh, to Palmer. I hope I'll have more space. And what I found is really very beautiful. And I'm happy that you have such great thinkers my dear friend, yeah, but at least I've read very many of your authors and I've writ written about them, okay? So this is my answer. It's precisely the paradox of using 
what seems at first to be an obnoxious word, canonicity, which is like the bitter pill that helps us to show how to bring the internal, mystical, pleasant, spontaneous thing with the seemingly unpleasant and bring them together and learn to look in a different way at authority. I'm not saying be subservient in a bad sense. Christ never said it, but, you know, to, to open our horizon. Okay. Yes, you're right. The thoughts of Alexei Khomeikov does not let us to fall asleep. It just wakens us up and leads us forward. And his intuitions and theological ideas and also what he had said about the people of God is up to now uh, stays relevant as we heard uh, during the second part of our conference. So Father Edward, thank you very much. Maybe someone else uh, wanted to ask questions. We have literally a couple of minutes for, 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 for a question. Maybe Sophia? No? Ah, Julia, Balakshna. Julia Balakshna has a question. Thank you for such an unexpected and in some places very paradoxical presentation. My question is about the interest of Komekov's, of, inter, of your interest to Komekov. Is this your personal interest or can we talk of a certain tendency in Catholic Church uh, to, 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 to an increasing interest to Komekov's in inheritance? Well, um, Yuli, uh, sorry, your microphone is off, Father Edward. Please turn on the microphone. You're out of microphone. Steve, can you hear me? Yes, now, yes. So, when I was studying philosophy in the United States in 1968, I was there for a number of years, many knew of Bergiaia. If you ask them to mention, to say, can you, do you know of any Russian philosopher? Oh yes, Berdyayev. Nobody knew of Solovyov. Nobody knew, I, I was studying in a Jesuit Catholic university, which was by no means backward. See, everybody knew of Ber If you ask theologians nowadays at the Gregorian, please, I don't want to speak ill of the Gregorian. They know so much. But I wonder how many would know who Homiakov is. I, I add to that my first love, if you like, wasn't Eastern theology. I started with, with uh, literature and it was my first love. Then I moved to Western philosophy, it was my first love. Then I went with, to, to Karan, it was my teacher. It was my first, his, his theology was my first love. Then I came, the order sent me here to the Pontifical Oriental Institute, and I discovered another world. May I say one thing, which is honest, and not to flatter you. I'm sorry that the worst propaganda for orthodoxy is not made by us Catholics, thanks be to God, that we don't do such things. Although there are some, unfortunately, who do, but those are the fringes. I'm sorry, at least I pose it as a question, whether even the presentation of these authors is not very often like a very scholastic, humdrum, insightless thing. See, the first thing I want to get out of a, of a philosopher or theologian, his insight, something I don't know and sometimes that creates context, you know, as when you are, you know, on Facebook or I don't know what, uh, academia, and suddenly somebody tells you, oh, I would like to contact. So, and much more, as Trito Isaiah says in Isaiah 55 on, you know, knowing God is falling in love. With God. That's what he says, if you read him, especially in the original Hebrew. And I claim that one of the best things about orthodoxy is that it has kept this flame alive. 
but it is not always transmitted, partly because of past experiences, there wasn't, a, but if you read, for example, even Berdyaev, I'm not a, by any means against him, you know, when you read his paradoxes, his, his aphorisms, or Humyakov, when, you, when I read his letters, yeah. oh, it's, it's, it's really a marvel, and I encourage you, you know, to be orthodox, you know. As a <laughs> so what about the law? The law can put off this fire. Can't it? It, the, the, the law can put off the fire that you were talking yes, about. Yes, but the law can also put off the fire when it, when it burns something else. Look, uh, love, spontaneous or not, is like fire, which in winter we had some very cold days they said it came from siberia in january you know and so if you have you know a heater uh, it's so nice to be in a cozy house in a cozy room but if the fire get, gets up our hand and burns the whole thing oh it's a disaster so I don't think that the law is law that's my point and I think in spite of his uh, idiosyncrasies, whom Yaakov is what he wants to get. And I'll tell you why I believe it. Although he, the Palmer, Palmer, the younger Palmer, and he are often criticizing one another, they are always criticizing one another in love. And the concessions he makes to, to even Catholicism, and although he, of course, you know, he rejects it, but I was surprised, for example, that he says so bluntly, the filioque is no heresy. It's terrible as for having committed fraud. But I really feel that that's the, it's not the law which, which, which puts out the light. As St. Paul says at the end of the first letter to the Thessalonians, please don't put off the light. And I think, that that's very important, and that's what orthodoxy, unlike Catholicism, I don't want to be a Pharisee. I love my Catholicism, and I think we have very many good points, just as you have very many good points. But your good point should be not to imitate us, but to keep the fire of inspiration in bringing together two seeming oppositions, law and love. You can... You can look, if you read, for example, the Seventh Council, the Second of Nicaea, no, the Seventh Ecumenical Council, you see, after having said so many marvelous things about icons and, you know, icons pretty much are, you know, theology in colors, you know, and things like that, then when it comes to, to the canons of Nicaea the Second, it says, something which really seems to be, you know, humdrum and normal thing you would say, you know, but it's really an eye opener. It says, in order to hold a house of prayer, you must have money. You read it carefully and that's what it comes to. You cannot get people together unless you are thinking down to earth with the law, if you like, how to keep them going, how to feed them. And, and all throughout, all throughout, if you read the saints, which are who are often terribly translated, Ephraim is a scandal. I, since I speak my native tongue is not English, it's Maltese, which is a Semitic tongue. We are all Catholic, but you know, I understand that Ephraim is not to be banalized often in that way. Maybe Brock did it. I think so. He did a good, but but a good job. But often he's translated so humbly drum that you don't get anything out of it. May I tell you something? We are in Mo you are in Moscow. I, I am a, a short article of mine, but it's not have a page. Uh, on the first Maltese translation of Pushkin, the, the first translation of Pushkin into my native tongue, Maltese, by a real poet who is my friend, it enthused me. Why? Because that's what a poet does. 
He scratches the surface and he, he brings you in contact with the real thing. Eh? And therefore, we, we look paradoxically, although Orthodox tend to say that, you know, Catholics are the law, which is also another caricature. But we do have, we, if, if anything, we have a negative approach to the law, I think, more than building it up. But both are necessary, both. Uh, uh, life is more faithfulness than enthusiasm. I might put it. Life is more being faithful than being enthusiastic. I don't know whether I have answered. If you have any other questions, please go raise them. I. Спасибо большое, отец Эдвард. Действительно, пока. Thank you very much, Father Edward. While you were answering uh, Julia, yes, you. Uh, Saint Paul says law is good if you not abuse it. But also, uh, we know Christianity is a fire, uh, which Julia has just mentioned. Christianity is either a fire or there is no Christianity at all, which was the quotation from Mother Maria, who died as a martyr. And Father Apostle Paul also says how I wish to fire to 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 go to grow. So we started from the Holy Scripture today's uh, session and this theological thought of the fire, fire thought in the 20th century, in the 19th century. I think we have come to a certain point to cover some distance and in understanding this theological intuition, what had already said as a breakout. And I think we together, we have all together done this one step uh, in Sobornost, and I think we hopefully uh, the first day of our conference has uh, successfully started. We'll go on tomorrow in the discussions and debates tomorrow and on the third day of our conference. We will be trying to be witnesses to how to broaden our horizons and our thought ideas and, and and the opportunity to, to go deeper into the understanding uh, Sobornos, which God reveals to all of us. I think we could finish here our session today. And I would kindly ask if it is possible, Father Vasily Mihok, if he's here. Father Vasily, are you, are you here? Are you listening? Yes, I'm listening. Father Vasily, I'm uh, asking you to uh, uh, um, to pray at the end of our session. Uh, but please switch on your camera. Mm -hmm. Lord, we thank you for this day. Um, of conference and uh, full of gifts which we received from our dear brothers and sisters. And we praise you together with the Father and the Holy Spirit. And we pray you to bless um, all the participants, their family, their families, St. Philaris Institute and uh, all the professors, workers, and students to bless our churches and to help us to um, follow the way of uh, finding our unity in your uh, love, in your truth. We praise you, our Savior and Lord, together with your Father, the eternal Father and the Holy Spirit, now and ever and unto the ages of ages. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. 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 Thank you.